The pads came on today. It was a good day. Dave got his vibe in one on one, so it was a good day. It was a good day. This is the Eagle Eye Podcast with Ruben Frank. I'm Dave Zangaro. After a much needed day off from practice, uh, back at it on Monday morning. Probably, I mean, this has got to be one of the coolest temperature wise practices in a long time. Yeah, it was it was about forty degrees when practice started. Oh, cool. No, it was, it, I actually was worried they might be going inside because it was raining driving down. It was raining all morning, uh, but I, it stopped. Actually, it was still drizzling when we walked down to practice, wasn't it? Still mm-hmm. drizzling a little bit, a little bit. Uh, but it stopped. The fields were wet, but the fields are in great shape. You know, when you only practice for fifty eight minutes, the fields don't really take a beat. I'm just kidding. Uh, the fields are in great shape, and uh, they. How, how long do you think we'll go with these jokes? <laughs> all summer. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they so they were outside, and I don't think nobody had any issues with slipping. Right, I just certainly didn't see anything, and no. that was good practice. It was, it was a yellow practice, practice Dave. Yellow practice. If I, we've probably talked about this, I think, but there's red, yellow, green. You can kind of figure out here. It's not, you know, it's not super coated. <laughs> it's uh, kind of a medium intensity practice. I'm assuming Chip wouldn't tell us if it was. <laughs> You're right. I'm yeah, assuming he that. would probably do it backwards. I'm assuming. Uh, Tuesday will be a green. They'll be in full pads Tuesday. Uh, today they were in shells and shorts. So basically their upper body had pads, not their lower body. Uh, not that it really matters because most of it's still, you know, the hardest they're going to go in practice is thud, which is like what it sounds like. You're not tackling, you're not wrapping up, but you're hitting and, and they'll hit this camp, but they are not going to tackle to the ground. They didn't last year. Uh, I would have been shocked, honestly, if sure. If Sirianni's like, no, you know what? We've, we're have we going to have tackled to the ground periods. And he was asked that. And, I mean, it's good to have it on, on the record. Just to, mm-hmm. But, I mean, yeah, I, there's obviously – they're not adding stuff. Yeah, and that's – so uh, we've talked about, like, practice schedule a little bit before. To me, that's the one that I've heard from most former players that would bother them the most or they think what they're going to miss the most is they don't hit enough. And, like, the first time you tackle for some of these guys is going to be week one. I didn't notice any big issues last year. There were like I didn't notice them like missing tackles. No. Or, but I think there is something to the shock of getting that uh, that heavy collision in week one. Maybe um, the first week was Atlanta last year, and they tackled really well. They were very physical. They, nobody had any any issues with it, which surprised me. Honestly, I was mm-hmm. skeptical going into going into it, but it works. And I, I got. I was talking to a former player. His name will, will go unknown, but before practice started, and that's all I heard from him was, I can't believe they're not doing this, they're not doing that, they're not doing this. How can they do A lot of it is legislated by the CBA. I mean, it's, it's, these things are limited. You can't wear pads on day one, day two. You're not allowed. Nobody does. Uh, I don't think what they do is all that unusual. Um, I think some, some Kind teams, of to the extreme a little bit. Yeah, I'm sure they, they do. But I think everybody's trending toward less on the field, more – classroom more more film uh, I, I just think that's the way the league is going and look there's a salary cap and you don't have unlimited players and uh, you got to keep guys healthy and this seems to be a way to keep them healthy but also get them prepared and everybody's trying to find the right balance of that and I think Nick had that last year when you look at the way they finished the season six and one be- before that meaningless Dallas game uh, it, it certainly worked so uh, I mean, look, I still have a little skepticism about it, about not tackling to the ground, about the, the length of the practices. I think they are very efficient when they practice. Uh, they get in and out of the huddle. They're, there's not a lot of wasted time. Uh, they seem to make the most of their time. We we were watching the, um, the one-on-ones, and the defensive guys were, like, jogging back to the sideline. Yeah. I've never seen that before. You know, they would do their rep and jog back, and the next guy's out there. Um, so – there's a real focus on getting as much work as possible into that uh, amount of time that they have. Yeah. They, are, they are maximizing. And that's, that's the key is that it's it, sometimes it looks like, and it is a little bit, but it's not like these aren't cake practices either. No, no, that's true. And thud, you know, there, there's guys are getting hit. They, they are getting hit mm-hmm. and they're just not uh, getting slammed to the ground. So they're in position to make the tackle. They're just not making it. And, you know, you can see them out there focusing on tackling form and being in a position to make the tackle and not making it. Uh, I'll tell you what, uh, how long were they out there today? An hour? Hour 15. An hour 15, right? With the developmental period. Yeah. I mean, 
we've seen coaches that practice for two hours and 15 minutes and probably get less out of that practice then. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so it's, it's not really how much time you're on the field, but what you're getting out of that time. Yeah, absolutely. You want to go through some observations? Let's do it. We'll start with the housekeeping stuff. Uh, Zach Pascal tweeted on Sunday about being in the hospital. We know he's been dealing with food poisoning. It's gone on longer than I think anyone anticipated. He hasn't been able to practice at all yet. He was not even on the field as a spectator. At least I didn't notice him on Monday. So, you know, he's a veteran, but and he he has some familiarity with the offense, which will help, but he needs this time with Jalen Hurts and he needs this time with Gardner Minshew. Yeah, he's missing valuable time. I mean, it's not that many practices. He's missed four of the first four. Uh, and yeah, it's not ideal. I mean, it's it's a weird it's a weird thing. I mean, I I've I've had food poisoning and it's the worst. Have you have you gone through that? Yeah. I mean, it is brutal, but it also generally seemed, at least in my case, you know, it was maybe two really bad days. And then on the third day, I think I was up and around. And then the fourth day, I felt fine. Um, I don't know when this started, but he certainly, you know, a week ago, Wednesday, last Wednesday, he wasn't out there. So it's been about a week at least. Yeah. Um, and it's not even like, you know, once he's physically over the ailment, it's like his, his strength is going to be zapped. Yeah. yeah he's gonna so it's going to probably take a while. Yeah. Yeah, so look, he's he's not the most important guy on the team, but he's your fourth receiver, and uh, they need him back. He needs to get back out there. And he's, you know, he, I mean, I don't know if he's even in the facility today. Um, we don't know when he got out of the hospital, so he's missing more than just practice. He's missing. If you're in a hospital, you're not in meetings, you're not in all that stuff. So missing valuable time. Yeah. There was some good injury news. Milton Williams, who missed practice on Saturday with an elbow injury, the first injury of training camp. Yeah, he was back in a limited fashion on Monday, so turning in the right direction. And then Grant Calcaterra, the tight end, we saw him go down on Saturday late in that practice. Good news there, I, I feel like. It's a hamstring injury that they're going to be very cautious with because hamstrings tend to flare up again. So um, it might take a little while for him to get back on the field, but nothing major there, and he should be back this summer at some point. Yeah, and he was he was kind of flashing a little bit. He was. Uh, he really secures, even from the first day. Yeah, he really catches the ball well. Yeah, and uh, so well, they don't have a ton of depth, certainly experienced depth at that spot. So, um, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's important for him to get back. Hopefully, it's not too long. Yeah, yeah, I know because he was off to a good start, and we'll see. I mean, I don't know if there's really anyone pushing for that job either. Like who else? Like Jay Jaw. We still think has, even though he's looked okay, he's had made some plays. I, I still think he's kind of got a an uphill battle. And the other tight ends, Noah Tagoa, we love, but I don't think he's going to make the roster. Uh, Tyree Jackson's still in the pup. Yeah, I don't know, three tight ends are hurt. Yeah, Richard Rogers is hurt, and uh, mm -hmm. and now Calcaterra's hurt. So, and Jack Stahl, is, you know, he, I saw he's caught a couple balls. Yeah, he'll be on the team. Yeah, like he his, I think his spot's pretty safe. Yeah, no, I'm just saying he's actually looked good sure. as a receiver yeah. so far. Yeah, but, and he did last year in camp too. And then right. when the season came, he caught four passes. So. He's never threw to him. Yeah, yeah. He had four targets. Yeah. What else you got? Uh, the biggest observation of the day was about Jordan Davis. Uh, and you called this one as soon as you saw the play. You knew I was going to make that my top observation. It was, uh, first off, like he's getting first team reps now. He started, he got his first first team reps. Uh, late last week, and that continued today. He was out there on the first snap of team drills, but really where he impressed the most was the offensive line, defensive line, one-on-ones. Uh, poor Jack Anderson, who's been in the league now for a couple years, so he has some experience. And I got to think there's a moment today where he was like, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> like, this guy is 340 pounds. His feet are so nimble and so quick. He, he is just a mismatched nightmare inside. Yeah, and one-on-ones really just give him an opportunity to unleash his, yeah. his power and his speed and his athleticism. Do you want to describe the rep? And yeah. Again, he was – so they're doing the one-on-ones, and as soon as this rep ended, I, I was you were about 30 feet down, down the sideline, and I just – I was like, did you see that? It's one of those plays where I watched it and my eyes went – Yeah. And you just kind of like – do a little head tilt. Oof. I forget who I was standing next Goodness. 
I think it was EJ, and I said that'll be the that'll be the lead item in uh, Dave's observations. <laughs> yeah, and I do love offensive line, defensive line. It's a great. It's trip. my favorite thing to watch in camp. Yeah, and it's not always super indicative of game situations because you're not always going to have one on ones, but it, it does give you a good sense of where some pass rush moves are and uh, some technique from offensive linemen. We'll talk about one of the rookie offensive linemen and what he did today, but uh, yeah, on that one rep, I mean. It, everything Jordan Davis does is naturally going to be set up by the bull rush because he's a monster, he's 6'6", 340. But the problem for offensive linemen is they can't just sit on that bull rush because he does have other moves. He's able to be quick and athletic. And on this one, he kind of, it was like a rip move right past Anderson who barely got his hands on. I mean, which is insane to think about. You can't get your hands on. And, and I'm not even ripping Jack Anderson here. Yeah. I mean, that it was it was more Jordan Davis winning it than Anderson losing it, but it's like, how is it possible to not get your hands on a three hundred forty pound man going through the middle of a of an offensive line? It's because he's that quick. It was just pure explosion. Uh, it, it was, I was in awe. Uh, you you don't see that like mm-hmm. those those one on one drills. You know they're generally really competitive, and uh, you know it, it, you don't really have like you know, first round TKOs in that yeah. drill. Uh, he just exploded past him. And it's like Anderson just like didn't, he just didn't know what to do. Yeah. And he didn't, and look, it's Jack Anderson. So, you know, you take it for what it's worth, but it was, it was pure explosion and it was impressive as hell. It was fun to watch. Davis didn't get any of those one-on-one reps against starters. Right. Obviously that we'd like to see that kind of wish Brandon Brooks was still playing. Cause that would be a lot of power <laughs> on either side of that. Um, but we'll see. He did get a rep against Cam Jurgens, who definitely held his own more than some of the other guys. Cam Cam looked good in those drills. He did. Let's talk about that a little bit because uh, he gets. Comp- Let's just finish on Jordan. Sure. Um, he had. I think I forget who his first rep was was against, and it was, it was uh, it was okay. But then he it reeled- was Sills. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, then he had a succession of of like four straight. Now none of the other ones weren't as. One sided yeah. is that one, but they were all impressive. And uh, he, he went against Cameron Tom, the new center, which, all right. Um, yeah, Jack man. Anderson, who has some experience, he, he, he had a good against rep against Coyote, Coyote yeah. Osika, who is a fairly good player. Yeah. Um, I, I was impressed by him today. And even in, he's starting to flash. I don't want to just single out the one on ones, but he's flashing in, in team too. He's clogging up the middle of that defense and. He looks. He looks like he belongs out there. Yeah, yeah. Today was the first time I, I found myself saying, "Oh, okay. Now I see what they saw in him." Mm-hmm. <laughs> we knew he was huge, but seeing that quickness was uh, it was shocking. Yeah, honestly. it's a good sign too that on the first day of pads, we're talking about how flashy the nose tackle is. It's it's a yeah. rare, you know. You think of he's just redefining that position for me at least, like. When I think, and look, I know there have been, you know, good nose tackles and nose tackles that can rush the passer. I mean, we've seen like Vita Vea in Tampa Bay is just a monster. He's super strong. But Jordan Davis is like the quickness aspect of it. Like I think of nose tackles, I think like Bo Allen, you know, who's a good player, but not yeah. this naturally gifted. It's It's going to be fun to watch him the rest of this training camp. Yeah, I can't wait till the next one on one drills. Yeah. It's fun to watch. Yeah, that's uh it must see TV right there. Yeah. Uh we we started talking about Cam Jurgens a little bit. Um he 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 held up quite well in those one on ones. The thing that strikes me is he he gets compared to Kelsey because they're both undersized and they're athletic. And I think when people hear that they're both athletic, they think about um, second level blocks and getting downfield and pulling, and all that's true. But you still have to block the line of scrimmage. And what Kelsey has become so good at, and he still has trouble with some bigger nose tackles. And Jordan Davis even said he's worked with Kelsey on that. They've worked a little bit together off the field because Jordan Davis' body type is generally a mismatch for a Jason Kelsey size center. But the thing Kelsey has always done so well is use his leverage. And he gets such a strong anchor because he understands the leverage game. And for Cam Jurgens to be able to do that in his fourth training camp practice, that caught my attention a little bit. He's going to need to. I mean, he's not, he's a relatively small center. So you need to have that 
ability, and he showed that, at least in these one-on-one drills. Yeah, I thought so, too. He's also powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not, like, I think a lot of the characterizations of him have been that he's this smaller, athletic, quicker guy, but he's a powerful dude. And that came through in those one-on-ones, too. But The um, power really has to come from the base and the anchor. Like, he has to, like, he's not going to be just plowing guys over. Right, right. Um, Smart, understands how to use leverage, Mm -hmm. uh, clearly. Um, Has been well-taught and well-coached early in his career or in Nebraska or wherever it was. But, um, yeah, he was – he looked good in there. Uh, I thought he was really consistent. It was it was funny after practice that you weren't there for it. You were in the other area. I was there for the end of it. Yeah. He, people were asking, you know, have you ever faced a guy as big as Jordan Davis? And he said, yeah, we had a, a like a guy who was almost 400 pounds in Nebraska. Like, did he move that well? He's like, oh, no, not like that. <laughs> like, yeah, I bet he didn't move like Jordan Davis. <laughs> if he did, he'd be drafted yeah. in the first round. <laughs> uh, Jalen Hurts. Anybody else in one on ones? I just want to interrupt it. Um, yeah, there was nothing that was super like guys we've seen. I thought Milato looked really good. Did you catch any BG? Yeah, he looked great. Yeah, I talk about him later in, in these obs. He, he's he looks he looks so healthy. I didn't mention the one on one. I mean, he he looks fine. Uh, Milato was able to really stand. So for Milato, the the guys who have always been his like size matchup problems are smaller. Like remember him working with. Joe Osman every training camp and there'd be times where Joe Osman's like whooping this dude and you're going, Oh, I can't guess my lot of might not be cut out for this, but uh he ended up being fine. Uh, but that body type has given him some trouble. So I, I saw him with some really good reps against Josh Sweat. I saw him get uh Tyron Jackson to the ground. So those plays and like him going against smaller ends who you know once he gets his his hands on them, it's done. But sometimes those quick guys have given him issues in the past. But the one on ones today showed me he's gotten better at that. Yeah, I would agree with that. Anything else from one on ones you saw? Um, no. Okay. No, it's a it's a great drill. I wish I wish people could watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, every once in a while, that'll be in a shooting period. No. I don't think so. No. Yeah, they're fun. It might show up on the Eagles website. I should probably shouldn't say that. They are, they're allowed to keep shooting when we have to stop. Yeah. They are, they own the team. They're allowed. Yeah. All right. Uh Jalen Hurts. Thought he had a good day. Not a not a like spectacular a spectacular day. Spectacular but... day. But I think that was more of a a reflection of what they were working on today. There weren't a lot of deep shots. I thought it was a lot of underneath stuff. And he hit his guys. I mean, there were a few misses for sure, and we'll talk about one of them later. But uh, there were two throws I wanted to highlight that were impressive to me. One was a slant to A.J. Brown, hit him in stride, coming across uh, toward the the right sideline. And that's important to me because A.J. Brown is a big yak guy. Once he gets the ball in his hands, he becomes kind of like a running back, and he's a really powerful player in, in that way. So... Um, a big play to A.J. Brown. This is kind of a staple of what Sirianni wants in his offense. He's he's always talked about this. Like Big plays don't mean necessarily downfield throws. They can be, you know, a 10-yard slant. But it's really important that Jalen Hurts hits these guys in stride. People who listen to this podcast are probably tired of me saying it. But hitting a guy in stride is so important for this offense, especially when you have players like A.J. Brown who do it really well. Yeah, and I think that's a real big point of emphasis in this camp i mean it seems like it is and he's he's doing better with it and um you know it's uh when you have a guy like aj brown it's such a weapon because he's going to get those he's going to get those yards and and um, he's a guy who has averaged close to like 17 yards i I think one year his first year was over 18 um but done it without you know running go routes i mean he's catching mid-range balls and and then taking them another 20, 30 yards. And um, that's when a, it's a high percentage throw and you're getting big yards out of it. That's that's the ideal that you want because generally a, a bomb is not a high percentage play. Um, that's why he's here. And you know, A.J. Brown's got the most most 30-yard catches in the, in the NFL over the last three years or 40-yard catches it is. Um, those balls weren't all thrown 40 yards in the air. Most of them probably weren't. And if they can – if they can build on what we saw today and master that, uh, he's going to be such a weapon. You know, 
because there's no reason Jalen can't make that throw. Mm-hmm. And we saw it today. That was good to see. Yeah. Another one was to Boston Scott. Boston lined up in the slot. Uh, and it was a quick play. Boston was, slot. Boston slot. Uh, it was a quick play. Had to get out. Uh, Hurts really kind of threw it off his back foot, it looked like. But it was, again, on the mark. Boston didn't have to slow down for it. I thought there was a play earlier in practice. Uh, Hurts completed the ball. It might have been the first play. or One of the first plays to Devontae Smith. It wasn't behind him, but it was like Devontae had to stop to catch it. So it was good to then see those throws later where he hits the guys in stride and they can kind of go with it. I just thought it was good for Jalen. He had a really good day the first day. He had a bad day the second day. He had a kind of uneven day the third day. Mm-hmm. I thought it was important for him to, because we talked about this before I think camp even started. What, what are you looking for from Jalen Hurts? He's going to have off days. Every quarterback does, but you just want to see, you know, you don't want to see that become a trend. Didn't turn the ball over when I mean, that was something Nick Sirianni talked about before practice. No turn, no picks today. Yeah, that's something that's bothered him a little bit. And there's two schools of thought here. One is that, you know, you practice what you play. The other is, and I, I kind of agree with it in some some ways, like you're working on things in practice. You'd rather throw interceptions in practice than in a game. And you're trying to figure out uh, what you can get away with and what you can't. So it's not the end of the world when he throws a pick, but you can tell it bothers Nick Sirianni. You know, they, they don't want any turnovers in practice. Donovan was big on that. I remember he would always talk about if he threw a pick at practice, he was like, I never would have thrown into that window in a game. I just wanted to see if I could do it. Um, I'm not sure Jalen's quite at that point. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. I think there's but, a difference between like Donovan in year eight and Jalen Hurts in year two as a starter. Yeah, but I do, I do think sometimes, and you know, sometimes it's just unfair. But, you know, we're, I mean, people are keeping stats on Jalen and everything, and you just don't know exactly what he's doing on that rep and why he's making that throw. I'm not saying it's okay to throw interceptions. I mean, it's it's generally um, not a good thing. But if the quarterback there, he's like, I want to see if I can make this throw. I want to see if I can put it in that window. Um, he's not going to do it in the game, um, and that's when you try things. You know, it's a, it's a it's a rehearsal. So you, you just look for those trends. I thought he was good today, and I thought it was important that he was good coming off the last couple. Exactly. Of days. Uh, one of the big misfires of the day was uh, between him and AJ Brown. I don't know who to put it on. It was, um, it looked like a fade. I, I don't, th- like, clearly they weren't on the same page. I don't know if Jalen missed the throw. If I, I, my, my guess here, and this is just a guess, is that AJ wasn't where Jalen thought he was going to be. And that's not to say Brown was in the wrong spot. It looked like he might have had an option on that route based on the, the coverage. Uh, but it, they were just off, and it, had, it was a potential for a big play. It might have been a touchdown. Um, but the good thing here that I noticed was a little later in that practice period when the third teams were out there, I noticed Hertz and AJ talking through the play on the sideline. And I could see Hertz like motioning and trying to tell him what he expected on that route. And then they, you know, after practice, they threw to each other. So um, they're still working on that. It's not going to just be people. I think some people thought that because they're best friends and they've thrown to each other before that it was going to come so easily and it probably comes easier. Right, but they're in an offense now, and they're playing with it. They're not having to catch. They're playing within the confines of of what Sirianni wants. So I think there is going to still be a learning curve. And you have to love that. I, I didn't see that. I, I read it in your OBS. You have to love that there, that that kind of communication is happening. I mean, we, we've seen quarterbacks and receivers who don't have that kind of relationship where, you know, they have that trust to go over. Look, I should have done this. You should have done this. It, it wasn't about whose fault it was. It's about Here's what I thought you were going to do. Okay, here's what I thought you were going to do. Let's figure out, you know, next time it won't happen. And that that's great to hear and great to see. Yeah. Uh, you gotta have that. Yeah, you definitely have to have it. Brandon Graham, I, I mentioned him earlier. It, this was the, the simplest observation. I didn't even bring up a play, but he doesn't look like a 34-year-old dude coming off an Achilles. He looks great. He looks great. He looks great. And, and he's and, always been a good practice player because he's, you know, super energy and all yeah. that. But. You always wonder, like, we, none of us were doubting him, but I think there were just natural questions about, is this dude still going to be as fluid athletically as he's been before? Yeah, and, I mean, he still has to prove he can do it in, in games, and but, I mean, so far so good. I think he looks really good, and he looks like BG. He looks like the BG of old. And then when practice is over, he's out there for another hour just, like, talking to everybody. And signing autographs and pictures, and 
he just won't he won't leave <laughs> he's like every day he's got so much enthusiasm i think he just maybe last year just kind of gave him a new appreciation for the just the whole routine and be i mean he was here for training camp but uh he just seems to be so happy all the time and uh yeah, he's like he's turned it up from ten to eleven. <laughs> he's he's great to have around. Like you can't be in a bad mood around Brandon Graham. Yeah, it is weird seeing him take second team reps. Yeah, it's been a long time since he hasn't been working only with the first team. Him and Derek Barnett. I mean, Barnett's been taking a lot of second team reps too because really their top overhang players have been Hassan Reddick and Derek Barnett. They kind of rotated the interior, Sweat. but huh? Um. I, oh, I meant Josh Sweat. Yeah, Sorry, Sweat. it's been Sweat and Hassan Reddick, where Derek Barnett and Graham have been with the second team, which is weird because it was always a that was always a pretty good cue that the first team was out there when you saw. I mean Barnett for the last what five years, four years as a starter. He wasn't a starter his rookie year. Started running the wrong way with that fumble recovery. That was scary. After the BG strip sack, he went down. Or just go down. Just anyway, yeah. Uh, what is he? I'm going to backtrack. What did you see anything you liked from Barnett in the one on ones? I I did not. I didn't, no. I didn't see much. No, I didn't notice I didn't see much there. Let's see a little more from him. Yeah, he uh, he had one uh, offsides today. He jumped. Sweat had a couple. Yeah. So oh, it's always him. There's a shock. Yeah, I mean, Bart, look. Barnett, though, as a rotational player, is fine. We'll see. Yeah, he's an average player. We'll see. Uh, he wasn't. He was below average last year. No, I don't think he was. I do. Like league wide average, you think he was below that? Yeah, I would think. What do you have? Two sacks, yeah. two and a half. Yeah, not all sacks. <laughs> Hurries. You, however you want to measure it, I'll bet he was. Below below the league average. Okay, I'll, I'll work on those numbers. I mean, is that average of every player who played or starting? Average? Oh, oh, uh, yeah, uh, I agree with that. Okay, he was below average as a starter. Yeah. He's not a starter anymore. Yeah, but I'm saying last year he was. I'm saying last year he was below sure. average. Sure, yeah. among starting players. Yeah, yeah, I don't. I think he's a below average player. There's a difference between below average starter and below average player. Well, it's not like he's out there to play special teams. I mean, yeah, he's, he's a, a rotational he's a 14th defensive Fourteenth pick in the draft, but th- he's not anymore. Well, he'll always be. No, but, I mean, like at this you can't point, undraft him. At this point in his career, though, he's off the rookie contract. I know what you're saying. I just think it doesn't matter average. where he got drafted. Below anymore. average. Okay, I disagree. I think he's uh, firmly in the average category. Below average. He does things that do not show up, and I'm not saying he's a great player, but that's crazy. He's not. He's not awful. I didn't say he's awful, but there's a big, big area between awful and below average. And right above that is where he is. And awful the average is like category. bottom 10%. Below average is 11 to 49%. If you're 49 percentile, you're below average because average is 50%. So you just took 40% of the possibilities, 10 to 50. I'll, I'll own that if you own that. It's unfair to say... If you're only looking at starting players, because he is no longer a starting player. So now he's improved from below average to average because he got benched. No, I'm just saying, <laughs> no, it's unfair to just compare him to starting players across the league because he's not that anymore. Well, I don't think he's average, but whatever. Okay. Below average. average. Uh, Gardner Minshew. Well, it was below average today. Okay. One day of practice. Uh, Gardner Minshew didn't have a good day. No, I was saying Gardner was below average. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he didn't look good. Didn't look real strong. Yeah, had uh, had a couple picks. One of them was uh, kind of a wacky, wonky throw that uh, Sean Bradley picked off in the middle of the field. Great play. Great play by Sean Bradley. As bad of a throw as it was from Gardner, it was. He's. I mean, he's the latest of the linebackers to make a play. They're all making plays. They are. This was a good one. Uh, and then a little later, Minshew. Uh, threw a ball to Rager that um, Rager probably could have come back on a little bit more, but Slay got his hand in there, knocked it out, and Marcus Epps picked it off. Epps' second interception, by the way. The the secondary and linebacking core are just so active. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think throughout camp, they've just been getting hands on balls, getting interceptions, knocking balls down. Uh, that whole group has been just 
just around the ball, making plays um, in the right place, playing instinctive, playing well together. It's uh, yeah, it's impressive to see. They're, I think they're just really giving the offense a, a much more challenging look than than last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's totally fair, and that's it's you know it's part of what we have to remember too when you're hearing about all right, Jalen Hurst doing an interception. It's like all right, well, the defense makes plays too. You know, if it's if it's just an awful throw or a bad decision, I think and and Nick Sirianni mentioned that like the bad decisions are the ones that bother him the most, but. Sometimes it is just a guy making a play on the other side, and that can be good too. It's like you can't just judge it by the offensive play. Like sometimes the defense is going to make plays, and you have to be excited about that. Those guys get paid too, Dave. They, they do get paid too. Uh, Miles Sanders, I, you know, he he's just been impressive every day. Yeah, he's looked great. He's he's running. I, I think he's running harder now than I've ever seen him run. There seems to be. <laughs> I think we touched on this the other day. His lower body is so powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, and when he runs, he's just like thundering down the field. Yeah. And, you know, those the, all the backs are finishing every play into the end zone. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, he, he looks great. Yeah, we talked about, like, the, you know, second team gate from the other day. Second team gate. Uh, it felt like he kind of manufactured a little bit of chip on the shoulder there, which – Whatever, you know, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. He's, he's running hard. He's been fun to watch. Yeah. Um, Nick was, Nick was adamant about he's, he's our guy. And I think that is the plan. Uh, Yeah. It has to be. They don't really have any other options. Not to, not to be the bell cow. Um, I'm really curious to see what his workload looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, once this starts, we know they want to throw a lot more than last year. I don't know if that means, you know, six to eight passes more. I don't know. Six passes more, but I just think he needs he needs you know 15 touches. I'd like to see him get that. Yeah. I don't really have much else. Kerry Vincent Jr. got some reps at that. I guess I'll call it the fifth cornerback spot. It had been going all to Mac McCain, who who played well. But my guesses are going to start rotating those guys a little bit more. Just the you know they have what, like six guys fighting for one spot, possibly Pretty much, two yeah. spots. So um, I'm excited to see some of them. I thought. All of them have really had their moments. Kerry Vincent had early. Tay Gowan on Saturday had a big pass breakup. Mac McCain has looked good. Jimmy Moreland has had his moments. Josiah Scott. Like all these guys are making plays. That's one of the the strangest position battles we've seen because those top spots are so locked up. Yeah. Even four deep, they're locked up. Because Zach McPherson's gonna be on the team. Right. But they, they have so many talented young players that you know, any two of them or one of them could make the team. Yeah, and they're not each – they're not getting a ton of reps just because the volume of, of yeah. guys. So they got to make the most out of the reps they get. Yeah. Uh, did you see my stupid observation of the day? I did. And it's something we had talked about. The music at practice has seemed a little quieter this year. I would have sworn there was no music the last couple of days. Yeah. Nick said there was. Uh, today you could hear a little bit. Yeah. coming, But I, I think – I know they got rid of the speaker that was on the side, like toward CVS. Yeah. I So I burned a question. You did. He was done too. He was done. He was oh, done I didn't want to burn a real question. Right. Uh, but he kind of looked at me like I was nuts. <laughs> he was like, there's been music. I was like, yeah, but has there like, like normal? There's no way. It's not even close. Yeah. Um, and he did mention, he's like, well, we have to be able to communicate with these guys. Yeah. Because yeah. at times I think it has been like purposefully distracting. You know, the music in practice. Well, that was Chip's thing when he got here. He said, I, I want these guys to deal with being distracted. That's when he started it. Yeah. And I've talked to players who and say, like. And just kept it because he kept everything Chip Sometimes did. it's tough when it's a song that, like, you want to kind of, like, sing in your head or, like, mouth the words to. Um, and you have to focus on the play. So sometimes it is used purposefully. It's not just, hey, we want to listen to something while we work out. Yeah. I, I always had that problem when Wilco came on in practice. <laughs> The, the a very rare occasion when longer. Connor stole the. I was, the, I was talking to Connor today. His his concert was a huge success. Yeah, they made a lot of money. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. it's you know it's funny because Japanese um, breakfast, Yola Tango. It's a good lineup. Uh, who else played? Was it Julian Baker? Uh, Yola Tango. Have you ever seen Yola Tango? I've never seen them. I, I'm, I'm a fan. An amazing live band. Uh, Connor Barwin, we're talking about by the way. If anyone missed that, make the world better foundation still doing really good work. It is funny though. It's you know. 
just by the nature of it, when a player leaves being a player, there's just less buzz around whatever they're doing from a, a charitable standpoint. It's one of the reasons I think Chris Long played <laughs> his last year. Yeah. It, it really helps. It's a different, you know, there's more attention to it. It's just, it's kind of a shame. Yeah. Cause well, they had a huge turnout. For that's, that, good. So. that's good. That's good. Well, he, he was smart. He did. He started it while he was playing, which like, that's the idea. You start it while you're playing and get some, get some feet under it first. I had a nice chat with Jeff Lurie about music today. Did you? Yeah. He's a huge music guy. He is. I remember you and I were talking to him, you know, what was I guess it was last summer when the documentary was out. Yeah. Yeah. So he, they're doing the Billy Preston documentary. Yeah. Uh, that's in the works. Uh, we talked about that. We talked about uh, jam bands a little bit. <laughs> uh, talked about Dead & Company. Uh, he he, asked me he what, said he wanted to see Dead & Company. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Um, he, he asked me what concerts I've been to over the summer. I got out my list. <laughs> <laughs> you like had a, you had like a role. Well, I was trying to think of like who I've, I've seen that he would have heard of. So I like, I don't want to sit there and name all these yeah. obscure bands that he doesn't know. So I told him I'd seen Lucy Dacus and uh, Sharon Van Etten. Talk about Jeff Lurie, by the way. I don't know if we mentioned Jeff Lurie. Yeah. yeah. Owner of the team. Yeah. Um, well, we know that. I don't know if we said Jeff Lurie. We talked about Sly and the Family Stone and, uh, yeah, we talked about the summer a little bit because so I went to college with a guy named Jerry Bembry. Do you know Jerry? He worked for uh, the Baltimore Sun for a long time. Really terrific journalist. His daughter was one of the uh, producers on Summer of Soul. Um, she okay. arranged a lot of the interviews. Actually, did a lot of the interviews with the with the artists. Um, so we were talking about about her. She won. She won a what, what are they uh, Emmys? I don't know Oscars, Grammys. I don't even know which. Been <laughs> for movie it's an oscar uh, oscar yeah i don't know i don't i don't follow i don't, I don't watch award shows but. you don't have to watch it to know the <laughs> tony award the biggest <laughs> pulitzer yeah, i don't know, it was, it I don't know one from the other <laughs> but well yeah so uh, yeah big uh, jeff's a big slide the family stone guy so uh, but yeah it was good good seeing him out there yep. uh anything from the media sessions that really stuck out to you? you talked to nick rollis today yeah Interesting yeah. guy. They they all kind of all the other coaches rag on him for being so boring. Like all he cares about is football. Well, that's yeah. Um, he is like a twenty eight year old position coach. He's really so. young. He's younger than half the team. Um, I mean, he didn't run from the fact that we're a lot better than last year. Mm -hmm. And you know, I thought he he said something really interesting. He said you could tell the guys who are in their second year in the system they're sharper. They're just you know, they have the answers. They know what they're doing. They 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 have that familiarity. And he said, and we have a couple of new guys, meaning Kazir and Nakobe. He said, we have a couple of new guys who seem like they're second year guys because they're so smart and they're so up on things that it like they're not even behind. Um, he's really he and he talked about Nakobe today. Sorry to cut. Yeah, you off. Nicobe today was asked about the difference between you know preparing for football in college versus the pros, and he's like. I don't have to go to class anymore. I don't have homework. I, have homework. I was like, I don't know if that's a problem for a lot of these other guys, but for Nicobe, that was a that. big issue. Yeah. I was thinking exactly what you just said. A lot of those guys that. majored in football. I know. It's like, yeah, I don't have a term paper to, to work on tonight. <laughs> I don't have a science experiment. Yeah, he's a sharp, he's a sharp dude. But he he uh, he was really raving about um, Davion. Davion. Mm -hmm. I always say his name wrong. Davion. Um, I never call you on it. I know. I let it go. I know. But you think it. I do think <laughs> it. <laughs> I judge you very silently. I can tell. Davion. Um, I pronounce everything wrong. So. That's why I'm never on the radio. <laughs> but uh, really raved about how far he's come from last year and just how, how much more comfortable he is, how much he understands the defense. Uh, talked about TJ and, and how much better he's playing. And he, he is. I mean, he's. All the linebackers look good. All of them. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so strange. It really is. It's Nothing just feeling real. I, I just don't know. I mean, when's the last time they had two? I guess, I mean, I guess in 17 with, with uh, Kendricks and, and Kendricks and Bradham and Bradham and, yeah. got and Hicks got hurt, but that was a pretty good group. They were all also older. Mm -hmm. It was an older group. Um, Hicks was still young. Well, what year was Jordan drafted? 15. 14, 15. So he was a third year guy. Uh, but this is, uh, I mean, this is the most depth. I, I, I've been doing this a while. This is the most depth, maybe the most depth of linebacker they've ever had. Ever. I mean, they have four. If if Davion 
can, and he's been terrific. If he can keep it up, they have four. Even, you know, Sean Bradley as a five. Yeah, I know. I like Sean Bradley. I know. He makes plays, doesn't he? Yeah. He's fast. Um, but they have four legit starting caliber, I think, mm-hmm. off-ball linebackers. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a new world around here. Anything else from the uh, media sessions? Jordan Davis is fun to talk to. Yeah. he's. I mean, he if he's the player we all expect, he's going to become – Quite a fan favorite because he has a great personality. He really does. He, he's really fun. Yeah. Oh, uh, I don't think so. No, I, I no. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. We'll throw up this up then. Let's do it. All right. If you enjoy the Eagle Eye podcast, Let's do this again tomorrow. Please rate and subscribe. I'm need a break. Wherever you get your podcasts, if you're watching on YouTube, please click the like button and subscribe there as well. We will be back. Uh, the Eagles practice again on Tuesday, so we'll do another podcast then. Then take a much needed day off on Wednesday. Be back at it Thursday. That's all we've got for Rubon Dave. We'll talk to you soon.